thing we want to talk about is bandsaw safety. See, I told you I would get to that. And uh, the most important thing about bandsaw safety is you keep your fingers away from the pointy thing. You know, I mean, I, you've, you've got to watch how much, aha, uh -huh. okay, you have to, uh, I, my grandson came over to the house one time. He, he, he's doing something for like Cub Scouts or something, and he was trying to get a merit badge for using woodworking. And I showed him different things. And one of the first things I showed him was to check him back here to make sure you're down to your lowest point. When you lower this thing down, you have a guard over the whole front. And if you've got it way down here to it just barely goes down here, you only have this much room, especially when you come up front, you got this much room that you could cut yourself. You know, the biggest way you're going to cut yourself on here, and I did, was I was cutting something that was about 12 inches. And I did several cuts, and then when I was done, I did something small. And I wasn't even making a cut. I was pulling this up here, and I went to one over there and hit the back of my hand on here. This was like five days before I was doing a class on bandsaw safety. <laughs> I'm thinking, great. <laughs> but... Anyway, when you get ready to do it, the best thing to do is, is put your, whatever you're doing, whatever stock you're going to be cutting, put it down below that and take a look at it. And that way you can't, like I said, when you run this through there, except for when you get by, if you want to put your hand there, but you're, you're, you're safe on there because you have this guard all the way up and down. And about a week or two after I showed that to my grandson, I went to cut something and I didn't check in back. He goes, you got to check in back. <laughs> so, which he was right. Okay. So... That's one of the, the biggest things is your exposure. And like I was talking about, when you go to wrap up the blade, it's, it's controlling. You, you have to make sure where you got your hands and what you're doing and everything for any tool. So, you know, that's a good way to measure and make sure you're on there. Um, on saw, unplug your saw during maintenance. I know I joke around about it and I don't do it. But for mine, we did change it over to 220. And I have to go out there like 15 foot away to get to the plug that's behind stuff. And like I said, 21 inches, I think I'm pretty safe. Now, like Bob brought up, if you've got other people working with you in the shop, you know, that they might hit the button, you know, you might consider that as a, another thing, whether you can do it or not. Myself, I've got a grinding cart station here, so I would have to get out of the way so they can come over there and get to the button, and that's not going to happen either. So. Okay, for the bandsaw safety, I use push sticks for everything. You know, if I'm holding a, you know, something going across there, two by four, you know, just to... You know, I get a lot of scrap wood there, and I end up burning it or giving it to Hans, and I'll run that through there, and I don't care because I don't need, it doesn't need to be straight, doesn't need to be perfect, so I throw it away. But I, you know, I make sure I'm controlling where I'm putting it across there. Okay, so you want to take care of that. You want to use uh, a push stick. I do not wear eye protection 90% of the time with a bandsaw. You know, I'm this far away, and if anything happens on the thing, it's gonna end. The belt breaks or the blade breaks it's going to be inside here so I'm not worried about that but you can send something flying you know I have been uh, cutting just uh, I broke two blades on cutting a blank for pin blanks you know if it binds in there wrong it hits that blade and breaks the blade but it doesn't do anything you know a chop saw you get that wrong you got some pieces all across the room use push tips I'm gonna show you a couple different ones and eye protection and one real important thing on here is the perception of this saw to this piece of wood. What shape is that? Okay. What shape does the bandsaw see? It sees round. Okay, if you ever cut a dowel rod on a bandsaw, when you get halfway through on it, it'll spin this thing on a dowel rod and it does the same thing with this. It does not know, you can take a, a four by four going across and it's halfway through there, it sees it as a round object. It does not see it as, as this. You can send that thing spinning just like that. And usually it only spins one time before it goes flying off there or breaks a blade. So holding on to it, when you're going through there where you're controlling it and go all the way through there, you're good. 
But if you don't have enough grip on it and it starts to turn just a little bit, this doesn't see it as a square, it sees it as round. Now what I do when I'm cutting it through there, even a dowel rod, I'll cut dowel rods, there's different methods, but the main thing I do is I just keep something you can keep control over. Obviously this one's not gonna fit on here because my track's on different, but I'll put it across here where I can, you know, I can clamp it on here or I can hold it, I can hold enough pressure on here that I can go through the, the without a problem. But you're not gonna be able to hold it by hand nine, you know, parts of the time. You know, you might get lucky on it, so you're better off just, you know, setting up something like this so you can control here and it's not gonna come off. As I'll take this block, uh, even a dowel, whatever, I'll come through like halfway and then I'll rotate it on here where I'm not going more than halfway through the wood. So if I'm doing the dowel rod, I'll go over and I'll rotate it side by side here so I'm not burying it into the wood. And the same thing when you're cutting something around like that on a chop saw. If you have a dowel rod, you're going through a chop saw, you get halfway through, it's going to want to try and pull it away the same way. So, you know, this is round to a bandsaw. And I guess the most important thing I, I did on this in any tool, just to know when to quit. You know, if you're going to go out there and you break a blade because you've done something wrong, or you're not lining up, you're not taking your time, it's just time to quit. This is what was brought in today for me to use. Where's Dan? Dan, okay. Dan was talking about this the other day that Carter had one of these because Bob and I made this big monster here and I'll bring it over here in a second so we can see it. This is fantastic on my jet, okay? It sets on there, there's a runner on the bottom and there's a spot on here. Now this thing on here keeps it from going too far to cut deeper into the wood. You can see the slot in the wood where it'll go to. But you can put a log on there, put these out and we can change these and put it and holds it really good so it won't spin. And it's the same principle as something small. If you get in there halfway through a log, using it by hand, you have a good chance that you're gonna mess something up. And if you're not using something like this, and you're going through a log, it's hard to keep it straight enough when you're feeding it through there to keep from bending your blade. You know, that thing holds it perfectly straight, and you can ruin a blade real easy by going through a big size log and turn it because you're gonna tweak it a little bit. You can do that, so that's a great method. This is something that Dan was telling me about the other day. You put your wood in there, it's got grips all the way up and down. You put it in there and this is all you need. So up to a certain size log, this would work fantastic. And I didn't have one, but I will have one Monday when it's delivered. Carter's got so many really nice things. I, I have broke a blade before with a pretty good sized log. And a lot of it's having assistance when you're doing it too. If you got a log that's you know, three or four foot long, Use a chainsaw, you know. I mean, I, I've had different ones that, it, well, if you don't have a chainsaw, come on my house. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I have taken some that log was bigger than what I should have and put on there and have somebody holding the end here. And if they're holding the ends in here, all you gotta do is have them move a half inch over there and you broke your blade, you know, so. And I do have the, there's a stand that comes with the part of the cutter system I'm gonna put on there in a second. Well, the stand makes it as a completely stand-up part where you can slide it all in there for a type of resawing, ripping, or yeah. Well, I, I use it for you know, and obviously you loosen it up. It has slots. You can move this all the way over, but you can do a pretty good-sized log on here. And you, let me turn this around so the camera can see it. You have adjustments on here. You can put this to wherever spot for whatever you're doing there and whatever's hanging off the log. You loosen up your ones on here and you can put it over there for how deep you want to cut it into, you know, you go all the way into here. And as long as you have your slot up to where it's at, you can have your wood hanging over quite a bit. This works fantastic and, and you can tighten up and you don't have to be completely straight on anything. You know, this can go up and down depending on your height and then you just tighten it up. They even give you an Allen wrench. With a magnet? With a magnet to hold wow. it there which is good because I, I lose my own riches all over the place. This is a great method of doing it to, uh, to do your resawing, and we're gonna get to resawing in a while, but while we're talking about Carter, I just wanna cover this one. Everybody's talking about blades. He's my neighbor, I can pick on him. He has a bandsaw with, what is it, a three inch blade? So when it comes time for resawing, that thing is dead on perfect. Blades itself are an issue, and a lot of it comes to, 
preference. The blade on my big band saw right now is a 3 8 inch blade. It came with, a, I think, a 7 8 I had that for a year and a half. It was just a tough, big, thick piece of steel. I mean, it, it's thick, not, not just deep. And uh, it worked fantastic. And I never had a problem with that. The only thing you can't do with it is you can't turn. You know, if you're using half inch or less, you can make some turning on there. You're better off never to, if you've got a blade that you can use for resawing, just use it for resawing only. You know, they sell, um, well, we'll go over this. Okay, for what blades to buy, I buy a good blade, but I don't buy the best. Wood Slicer from Highland Woodworking is fantastic for cutting a straight line and doing resawing. You know, it's dead on perfect. You know, they have a, a set in the teeth, one, 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 one way, one other, and it has three and four inch, three to four teeth per inch, depending on what you're getting. And my problem is they, you can't use those for general cutting through other stuff, you know. If you turn that at all, you've ruined the set on the blade and it'll never resaw perfect. So if you're doing nothing but resawing and you want straight all the time, you know, that is a fantastic blade, but I use mine as universal for all kinds of stuff. And I'm not going to take it out of the closet and put it on there just to cut something and then take it back off and put the other blade back on. So I really kind of wasted my money on it as well as it cut. I'm not going to go through that whole procedure every time. And, and that's really the reason why I have two bandsaws. You know, because I have the 18 inch bandsaw, it's for uh, not just resawing, you know, logs, but resawing any type of wood, you know, that is on there and there's a lot of parts to it. Now, I've, I've never really worn down the tips on a bigger blade, you know, these, you know, three, three tooth per inch is what I use on almost everything on, on the big bandsaw. I've never worn down, even, even this one, as old as it is, you can feel it's very, very sharp and catches everything. And on the little one, so when I'm using a, a 3 16th blade, you can almost rub your fingers the wrong way on it after it, it's worn for a while. So just buy the better blades for that. But not, I would not spend 40, 50 dollars on a blade that you can break in, you know, the first couple of times you go out there and use it. So anyway, get a good one, not a great one. And as far as what size and TPI, it has to do with what you're cutting. You know, for a smaller one here, like my Delta, it's a 14 inch bandsaw and the blade I use on it is usually, uh, it's gonna be quarter inch or less, but I don't even buy the quarter inch, I use 316. Cause mainly I'm gonna do sharp turns and your turns has to do with your radius. This is a chart. This is the one talking about the radius. And I'll talk about the different ones. We don't have to hold it up there, but if you're doing, um, if you got a one inch blade, about the smallest circle you can turn on a bandsaw with a one inch blade is seven inches. So you just rotating it around. Now I do that a lot when I'm doing a, a log or something. You know, if you, you, you take a log to, to turn it, to make it to a bow blank, you take whatever the round is, say if it was 15 inches across, you take and you cut that thing lengthwise up and down, you know, with the grain, and then you end up with two half curves. And then when you're done, you want to turn it round. So you lay it flat and then you make your circle around on that thing. Well, I use a blade on here. It's usually uh, three eighths or half inch I'd use. And I can go out there and make a round circle. So when I put it on a lathe, it's setting up like I want, pretty much block instead of lopping off all the corners. So, but you, you all the way through with the different ones. If, if you're using a half inch blade, which is half from front to back, you can make a turn on that thing on a bandsaw that's about two and a half inches. And then, Radius, right, two and a half inch radius. And then it gets down to three eighths, quarter inch. And then when you got an eighth inch blade, you can make a three six inch, inch radius. That's a very tight turn for a bandsaw to get a, a three sixteenth, you know, little circle you're putting on there. But um, I, I found this really easy to find a chart because it's one thing I wanted to tell people about. If you're trying to go out there making a smaller radius than what it's got on there, you're straining the blade. If you're taking it and you're making a turn and not just on uh, just flat wood or whatever. If you're going on there, you can hear it hitting a bearing hard or something like that. You're, you know, you're damaging a lot of different things. And one thing you don't think about when you're hearing those bearings run all the time, if you don't have it adjusted, that bearing heats up and the bearing heats up, it heats up the blade. And the metal itself is, a, is heat treated when you get it. And for you to heat up the metal on the blade because of the bearings, you're messing up the bearings, you're messing up your blades. So. You know, you don't want to be forcing where you're hearing that, that roar going the whole time because you know you're doing something rash. My, my picture's going away.
I don't need it anyway. Okay. So, I do have, like, like I said, I like the idea Bob has of writing it on the inside of a bandsaw. You know, if you don't think about it, in fact, a lot of 14-inch uh, bandsaws, you're looking at a, a 93.5 or 96 or something like this, and this one is 105. And I know quite a few people, because it's actually got like a riser block built into this one when you get it. And you know, they're all different. So if you don't know what it is, make sure you have it and then just write it in here. For We've, we covered uh, different maintenance blades. And next thing I want to talk about is resawing. Resawing is something that I get a lot of use out of. And I get a lot of people coming over asking me to resaw something for them. Let me put it all the way over here. Okay, now you can resaw, you know, there's a post that comes on some of your fences. You can resaw with a, a post, you can freehand it, you can put different things on it, and I'll just show you a couple different methods on here. I had, this is what, this was Carter's magnetic fence, which is fantastic as far as you lock that thing down, it's not moving. The biggest problem I found on it is alignment. To align that thing going across here, exactly the same across on here was kind of a problem. So I did have a piece on here that was set up that was in the back or here, and it's not anymore. But if you put something on here, what I had was something like this, and these were glued together on here for a certain distance. I can put this on here, line it up, tighten it up, and then put it over the other side, and put that on there. And that way I know I am perfectly parallel with that. Now doing it like that, you know, I have blocked because there's something I was doing over and over again where I put it on here and that way if I put it back on, I do it and take it off. But on here, you could cut this to whatever you wanted. You know, so that's just a way of making sure this is alignment there. You also have your regular standard fence that goes on here, which I'm not sure why we bought the magnetic one when we had the regular fence. Okay, so putting this on here, when you do the resaw, there I have a Craig fence that you can see instead of the one here, which is something, gonna be something sort of like this. Because what's gonna happen is the board itself that you're cutting, you, you don't want it much more than what this fence is. This fence is pretty low or this one's pretty low. If you're gonna put a board on there that is like this high, you be okay with it if you're careful, but anytime you push it on the top there, you know, I, I am going to use a feather board, and I'll show you that in a second. Anytime you put it up on the top here, you're putting pressure on here. So the higher you can have this up, you know, where you can keep it running parallel with this, the better. Now, I'll put this one on first and we'll show that. The, your standard magnetic fingerboard like here goes on there and it's pressing on the bottom of here, which does pretty good. But I put this on here because I want it up higher. And when you were talking earlier about, you know, running the board through here, and somebody had mentioned that once you get past here, you, you lose control. So I put this on something like this. I put this on like here. So, and put some pressure on it, lock it down, which on this one it may not even lock down because we're in a groove here. Yeah, I lock it down on this, so once I get past here, I've still got pressure on the back of this part here. So I do, I do like the second level, because putting it on here, when you get back here, if you don't have this on here, you're still gonna have to push on here and hold this against the fence. You know, so, and you can actually go up higher than this. When I hit here, I'm, I've hardly got any pressure on it there. But I, yeah, I see what you're saying, yes. Yeah, you don't wanna don't close want to it up. It. Right, yeah. And I'm, I'm usually, about like right there, not way back to the back half. But uh, you know, if you had three hands, we'd be all set when they're doing resawing. Now, I have different resawing parts on here. I, I have, like I said, I have a regular fence instead of the magnetic one. But I bring it up here. I have this one on here. It just slides on. It puts it on here when I'm doing the taller boards. I just switch over. To a higher one. This is the one for the jet, which doesn't work very well on this little one. But it is, and I don't want to go all the way up top. 
But when you put it on there, at least you have a lot more control with that. You know, you don't have to go up as high as what this does. The jet will open up, uh, I think it's 12 and a half inches. And I'm actually thinking about making one about as high as this. So when I'm going to do it, but you, when you've got this much between here and here, and you got some pressure on it, it's going to float by pretty quick. So you don't have much problem with that. That's my normal method of resawing. When we were doing uh, the Blancy bench, we had to resaw a bunch of different stuff. And some of it was like five foot long, you know, that you're taking a board, you're going across and you're sighting back this far. One of the things to do to make it safe for you is working with other people, just to hold the end up or something. Because some of it was uh, like four inches thick material and I'm holding it out this far trying to guide it into there. So getting somebody to help with that, but you can't get them to steer it because two people on that does not work. So this is another method that you can use. I put this on a table saw and I cut a spline on each side, not deep, but that way when you put this there and then you're gonna resaw it and just resaw it by eye, you go over there and you get it in the right spot, it's gonna go to the path of least resistance. So when you go over there, it's, it's no problem at all to take it from that and sit there and cut that right down the middle or you know, right down to the edge and follow the line. You know, you've, you've got a great line there to follow because you have a gap that big, but you just go to one side or the other and just follow it. That's a really easy method of cutting it and keeping it straight to do it by hand. A lot of times when we're cutting something like, if we want to book match a piece, so if we had a piece like this, that's a three quarter inch, and you want to book match it, so you want two pieces of it to something smaller for like we were doing a lot of little uh, keepsake boxes. We did a lot of those. What we did was we cut that in the middle, so we ended up with three pieces that are around three eighths, or two pieces, I'm sorry, that are, we, you can do a quarter or smaller, but no, we were, we were ended up with two pieces that were around uh, three eighths, and then we ran it through the planer, so we, when you got done, then we ran through the planer, so they were, they were equal. It didn't matter what they were, because we we're gonna cut a slot for them to fit them in as top and bottom of a box. But that was just a good method of doing it. That way, when you look at them, they're book matched. And especially if you are doing a cabinet or something that you have uh, face frame and you're putting all the stuff on there and you want the two to match, the two sides. If you have a 12 inch piece, you put one on one side, one on the other. And if you cut it like that and open it up, they're gonna match each other. So that's just another reason why you would want to do the resawing on there. I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, push blocks, but I also had a board sitting out here. You wanna plan ahead on your cutting if you look at that and you're doing like a molding or you're doing something, how to cut that on a bandsaw, it's really easy just to make your first cut right across here. You know, and then you come by and make your cut there and cut there. So, so just sort of plot away when I'm, when I'm doing something that has a lot of different curves. And when, when we were doing the canes, we had each one, you could only go so far with a bandsaw and then you, you don't want to back your bandsaw off on, you know, 20 something inches and be taking a chance to pull a blade off. So before you start, Make your cuts across in different points so you can just drop those pieces off as you get past there instead of have to go back. So, I mean, it's, it sounds simple, but if you take that bandsaw, you get all the way there, and if it's straight, it's not bad, but you got a curve on there. So if to back it off and make that curve and get out of there, a lot of times you pull the blade off, off of the, the wheel doing it. So just look at it ahead of time, see which way to cut it. Okay. On the push blocks and stuff, I have, this is what I use when I'm doing resawing for a push block push block that's written on there because somebody come over there and see a chunk of wood on the bandsaw say well it's trash and throw it away so anyway I, I had to label it but what I'm doing when I'm pushing it and let me turn the saw okay <laughs> I'll, I'll put it on there and I'll get this and I'll get it on the edge of the board like here and like I said I, I still use my block but I hold on to it like just right here you know, and I can push it a ways into it without it, but then when it gets near the end, I'll put this on here and I'll just hold it. And all that lip's gotta do is hold it in place while I got it with my other hand. That way I'm nowhere near it. One thing that always scares me on a bandsaw is when you get to the point where you're on the edge there where you're, you're close to the blade, you know, and it doesn't matter what you, this is, I, I think Bob did this or something, I'm not sure why, but you can use it as a push block, the same thing here, or you can actually push onto it here when you get to there to push it through. You know, and these just take seconds to make something like this. And I do this sort of like the thing we're doing. Could you go ahead and plug that in? Now, in order to make these things, and I keep several of them around the house, you know, it, it just seems 
stupid, which I can do that. And I did put it back to make sure because my grandson might see this video and I'll get in trouble later. Okay. So all I'm doing is putting a block into about where I want to be at. And you put it on there. <laughs> okay. And then I'll cut it down to there. And then you just use this as a push block. This is so much easier. One thing I do have in my shop, I think they're by, by Craig, but they're, they're metal. And it, it's made out of the same material as most of the other stuff there. I really leery of sticking something of metal on there. Mine are not pointed anymore. So they, they've had too much use. And this one, you could, I mean, they're like $3 or something. So if you go out there and you hit the blade or something like that, you're not losing anything. And this one hasn't, I haven't had this much. No, it's not going to hurt the blade. As, as long as you go straight, it would cut right through here. You know, but when I'm pushing on a board and I'm trying to push it through, what it's going to do is chew this up a little bit. The metal thing is going to tear up your blade or, you know, anything. Or you could actually break the blade if you get it caught wrong. So make whatever you want for push stocks. I, I've got one cart underneath my uh, table saw that has nothing but accessories. And there, there's got to be 15 or 20 different push blocks, and it's what your preference is. You know, I, this is a great method for me. Even if you're not doing something with uh, using a fence, if you're just using a smaller board running across here, you could easily just hold this right on there as you're pushing through and do it. So just make a bunch of these up or whatever you want. And I don't think there's anything that I didn't cover on here. You, uh, there's a lot of accessories that we've made before. This was made to, uh, to put it in there, the slot goes inside, and it keeps it from going too far, and you put a pivot point on it, and you have parts on here that you can use for bandsaw circle cutting. I didn't see a real need for it for the most part because you can just turn it by hand and make your circle cutting, but you have points on here to, you know, that you put it on. You would put a nail through here to whatever you're cutting, and that tells you you're going to cut a seven inch radius and you just turn it right into the blade. So you're going to put it all the way, you're going to bury it all the way into the blade, you know, which doesn't fit on a slot here, but you bury it into this far and then whatever point you put this, the nail to the board and turn it, that's going to make your circle on it. And I usually just take a compass, draw a circle and I just cut it out by hand. And with a three eighths blade, you can cut a pretty sharp turn. And I can even give you the figures on that if you need. This is about the same thing as what we were dealing with earlier. There's sandpaper on here, a PSA paper. So you can put it on there so you can hold it tight when you're going across. A lot of times I'm cutting pin blanks. And for the longest time, I would put the tube for the pin blank inside of here. And I would take it by hand and go across like this. I did it like that for more than 10 years. And two people the same week said, that sure looks dangerous. Well, Why did you tell me that 10 years ago? So what I ended up doing is putting this thing here. I can I put the tube on to figure out where I want it at, line it up, bring it over here, and I hold the thing on here and just one after another, and you don't have any problem. I do on my smaller bandsaw. It, it has 12 teeth per inch. You know, if you do it with a three tooth per inch, I'm, it's just so grabby. I, I don't like that at all. But, you know, with a 12 tooth per inch, I, I do take the, the longer stock. I buy the package of like 10 of them and I'll put them on there and I'll cut it and pull it off. But you cut, cut it, pull it off. Now when I'm cutting the tubes, so I'm going back, I put it on there and then I pull the tube off of there and then bring it back. I, it seems like when I, with a metal tube, when I'm pulling it back, it would it come back here, sometimes it turns a little and pinches. But if you hold it enough control on it, you're okay with that. But I do the same thing with all my pin blanks now. I'll put them on there and I'll go by and take it and set up the two of them and like that. And I don't have my fingers anywhere near it. This was originally for the Mesa pins, which is a Wall Street, you know, different ones. And then we did a little different, a little different. And, they have it, and I've got like five, I mean, it takes you, just to cut the board and put them on there, it takes you like two minutes, you know. So I, I have them hanging on the wall and I don't even know why I keep this one. It might've been one of my first ones I 
I treasure it so much. You know, to me, it depends on how much room you have in the shop. You know, you can take a, a, a bandsaw. If you don't have a table, a lot of people start off with a shop, they start building it with a table saw. That's your main piece that you have and you work around it. If you don't have much room in the shop, you don't need a table saw. You can cut all your stuff with a bandsaw. I have a uh, Makita track saw. So if I want to cut a sheet of plywood, if I'm by myself, even now, if I'm by myself, instead of using my table saw, I'll set up saw horses and I'll take that track saw and I can cut it perfect. And you can also take a wood that's air dried, that has a curb or a bowl to it, and like banana wood, you can put that on with a track saw and take the, the deepest part of the bowl there and cut that and on both sides, end up with a straight board just as good as you can with a table saw. In fact, better than what you can with a table saw. When we had a lot of that to do, we put that track saw on, we straighten out one edge, and then we'll take it and do the other side with a track saw. So a lot of stuff you can do with this, it doesn't take up much room like you would a table saw. So this was my highest priority. I, I've had this long before I had a, a table saw. Well, I'm done 10 minutes ago. I just figured if anybody wanted questions, if there's no more questions, we'll get Larry out of here. Thank you.